Hello, my name is Robert L. Reed. I'm the founder of Public Invention. It's an honor to be speaking to you today because I'm not a mathematician. The title of my talk is Calculating the Segmented Helix Formed by Repetitions of Identical Subunits. This work is condensed from a longer work which is available at my website at the URL that you can see on your screen. All of the work that I'm about to demonstrate can be demonstrated with an interactive web page that you can go to yourself at this URL, which you can also find at the GitHub repository where all the code lies. Because all of this code runs in the browser, you're welcome to uh, go to it right now during my talk and browse to it. You won't be interfering with each other. Public Invention is a nonprofit. In 2018, we ran a mathathon in which we observed something which I later found to be published, a statement by Eric Lord. In nature, helical structures arise when identical structural subunits combine sequentially, the orientational and translational ratio between each unit and its predecessor remaining constant. Uh, I spoke to Dr. Lloyd about, Lord about this. Um, he was a little embarrassed that I named it after him, but I have been unable to find this observation in print previous to him, so uh, until I do, I'm going to continue to call it Lord's observation. This research and the mathathon were driven by my interest in robotics, in particular Tetrobots, created by Dr. Sanderson about 25 years ago. Uh, I, this is a research robot that I made, a seven tetrahedra robot. This applies to tetrahelices, as you can see diagrammed here, but it also applies to other uh, kinds of structures. This paper proves Lord's observation, gives closed form expressions or algorithms for calculating the actual helix from the shape of the repeated subunit and its joining rule, and proves that the twist creates a continuing spectrum of helices. I'll explain that more later. And we also show that there is a zoo of 28 unique platonic helixes. Because of the math in this paper, we can calculate the um, radius and curvature and other features of all of those platonic helices. I'm not sure it was identified that they existed previously. A segmented helix is just like a continuous helix, except it's broken up into segments. You can think of it as a formula that given an integer n and a radius and an angle theta uh, and a travel d gives you back a point in space, and those points always lie on a continuous helix. Because uh, it's discrete, you can define a few things that you can't define for a continuous helix, like the length between the nodes. It's useful to define the tightness of a helix to simply be the travel along the uh, axis of the helix divided by the radius. If you think about the old slinky toy, which is in fact a helix, in its relaxed state it has very low tightness. As you pull it further and further apart, it becomes tighter. Uh, a uh, tightness of zero corresponds to a torus, which is a kind of degenerate helix. A maximally tight segmented helix has all the nodes in a single plane or sometimes even a single line. Those kinds of structures, a line or a coplanar zigzag shape or a torus, don't appear to be helices to the human eye, but if we think of those as degenerate helices, we can unify the math of all of these concepts. I'm about to give you a compelling visual proof, but in the longer paper you can find a detailed proof of Lord's observation. Uh, basically, it's simply an inductive use of Chastley's theorem that any transposition of objects has a screw axis, and that when that is repeated regularly, the screw axis lines up, and by induction, uh, you generate a helix. I'm now demonstrating a website that any of you can use while I'm talking here. Um, it creates a 3D space, and what you're seeing here is three prisms, but in reality there's one repeated subunit, which is defined here. The C face is perfectly perpendicular to the axis, and the B face is a little bit off. I can change it just a little bit here if I want. And then in this space, I can demonstrate Lord's hypothesis, Lord's observation, very nicely by increasing the number of prisms. Right now, it's not completely obvious that these prisms form a helix, but as I add additional prisms, it starts to look more and more like a helix until eventually we've gone around quite a few times and it's very obviously 
a helix. This is, this is true no matter how I change the shape or how I change the, the way these helices are conjoined. It doesn't matter if I'm using a prism or some other shape there. No matter what you do, you always get a helix. This is in fact Lorb's observation, which is proven in my paper. The math that is primarily in, in my paper um, computes all of the important features of the helix, which goes through the center of the joint space, the radius, the travel, the angle, theta, the angle phi, um, the axis, and the pitch, and the uh, feature which I call tightness, which I'm going to demonstrate later. So um, all of that is essentially um, closed form expressions, which I'll, I'll give later. Now, you may observe that there is a thin green line going through this segmented helix. In reality, the green line is generated by my math and the uh, other things are conjoined face to face using standard graphic uh, placement algorithms. So in a sense, the fact that the green line intersects the uh, joints even after many iterations is a proof that I've gotten the math correct. So the green line, although it, ha it hits the joint intersections, is not computed from the joint intersections. It is in fact a helix generated from these properties down here, which are computed purely from the face uh, faces of the prism, of, of course their length uh, between the faces, and the, the twist angle, which we can vary um, between the uh, uh, the way that the prisms are conjoined. Now I just accidentally demonstrated something that I'll show later in the talk and that is there's a continuum caused by changing the angle tau. In the longer paper I actually developed the math for how to do this twice. Once using the linear algebra which is typically used by graphics programmers and computer programmers to compute things and secondly as closed form expressions. And you might ask why would you do that? Well if the face angles and the shapes are coming to you uh, numerically anyway, you might as well use linear algebra to compute them, which is very convenient for computer programmers. However, um, that's terrible for mathematicians because it precludes the possibility of finding closed form expressions for something. And so uh, I personally believe having the closed form expressions of the uh, helix properties is very important. And here it is. This, uh, it, this one page summarizes the closed form expressions necessary to compute the helix giving only the four points A, B, and C, uh, and D representing a um, repeated subunit. This is based on an algorithm from chemistry by Peter Kahn from about 20 years ago. It uses angle bisectors and basically I've taken some linear algebra, torn it apart, and broken it down in order to get these closed form expressions. Now, this page is ignoring some degenerate cases, the degenerate cases of the helix corresponding to the torus, the zigzag condition, and even a straight line. Um, all of those are unified by the math, but in some cases, uh, in those cases, this math doesn't work because you divide by zero, and there's slightly different formulas are necessary for that, but they're very similar to this. Because this work is so simple, it's also invertible, which means that you can take uh, known points and determine the parameters, or you can, uh, given parameters that you seek, define the faces, the face angles of the subunit, which will be necessary to produce the helix that you wish to design. The second theorem proved in the uh, paper is that changing tau smoothly changes the tightness and always moves through perfectly flat cases and generates a torus in the middle. Now again, if we're dealing with physical objects, self-intersection would prevent that from happening. But I think this is very interesting and this proof was actually a lot harder to make. You've already sort of seen a uh, visual proof of this fact. And I proved that there's a continuous spectrum where we can go all of the way around from what is normally what I call a very tight configuration here where it's this is a, a zigzag configuration in the sense that the um, the helix is in its planar that is the 
joints are actually planar, um, even though that is a form of a degenerate helix. And then I can go through the zero point, and if we assume, of course, this would not work because of self-intersection if these were physical objects, but mathematically speaking, we can turn it into a torus, and every such system can be turned into a torus. There's always some point at which this becomes a torus. But we're getting close here. Now we just went through ourselves again, and we can move way out to the tightest configuration on the other side that's not quite as tight as it can go I'll go all the way out to the maximum tightness on the other side here we have once again the zigzag configuration or the maximum tightness which is given by our um, value here to a roboticist, this theorem says that if you only change tau with repeated subunits, you can go through a wide variety of polymorphic shapes, that you can really change the shape of a collection of subunits. You might assume that the torus is always produced at an angle of a tau or twist angle between the faces of zero, but that is not the case. If you uh, set both b.x and c.x so that both faces are slanted and not completely symmetric, then in order to obtain this toroidal shape, you have to um, experiment with tau and it can get as high as negative 3.6 or something else. So the fact that it always moves through a torus uh, is not as trivial as it may have seemed. So by the way, this math took about 167 lines of JavaScript to implement. Uh, and it, since it's almost a closed form expression, it's extremely efficient, it takes almost no time at all. Um, and so it allowed me to do something which I don't think has ever been bef done before, which is to enumerate all the possible platonic helices. That is, the helices formed by the platonic solids when conjoined face to face. The famous burdick coxeter tetrahelix is one example that's relatively well known, but uh, in fact you can do this with any shape. That's the point of the math that I've produced. It doesn't depend on it being anything like a platonic solid. But in the case of platonic solids, we have closed form mathematical descriptions of the face angles. Because I had this math available, I was able to um, eliminate uh, duplications and produce only the 28 unique such um, platonic helices. And I actually cataloged all of them and gave them names based upon their appearance. And perhaps First, I should show what a platonic helix is, or helix is. Um, here, I've modified the program to create something. This is the classic burdick coxeter tetrahelix, which is made only of regular tetrahedrons stuck together. And so, um, a platonic helix is made of the regular platonic solids joined face to face. Now, depending on the shape of that face, you have to say what the twist angle is. For a triangle, there are three. For um, the dodecahedron, there are five twist angles that, that you can accept. And you also have to, in some cases, say which face should be conjoined. Now, this is, the tetrahelix is relatively simple. There are only three face angles. This makes a toroidal configuration. And this is the opposite chiral form that goes in the, the opposite clockwise-ness or handedness uh, from the previous form. In investigating the platonic helices, you can choose tau, the twist angle, to be anything you want. But it makes more sense to choose a tau which makes the faces match exactly. So to investigate all platonic helices, you choose which face you want to match and which angle you want to match. When the, the shapes are more complicated, you have to decide how to conjoin them. So certain uh, faces, that's a tor torus, actually. Um, this I call the staircase thing. So there are actually um, about 128 different possibilities when you consider all of the uh, possible faces and angles. I find the dodecahedron particularly beautiful, and you can select different shapes here. But this was computationally so easy to do that I was able to build this table, the zoo of platonic helices. And I'm going to now show you my, my favorite one. All of these can be drawn by clicking on this, this button. 
I'd like now to quickly run through all of the shapes and giving them their names. Box beam, staircase, block helix, octobeam, octospiky, octomedium, dodeca beam, dodeca doubler, the alternator, dodeca corkscrew, pearl shaft, quasi planar, two strands, slow twist, rock candy, icosa tree star, icosa corkscrew, planar point cluster, big icosa corkscrew. The toroidal forms are a little easier to see with the lower number of prisms rendered. This is the tetra torus. This is the cuba torus. This is the octagear. This is an octahedral form, which I call the tree star. This is the dodeca donut. This is the icosa tree star. The planar point cluster. The planar point cluster. Finally, this is the wheel. The first platonic helix studied um, was studied by Coxeter in the 50s and 1960s, I think, and he defined the burdick coxeter tetrahelix and gave analytical or closed form expressions uh, of all of the parameters that I've defined here. As far as I know, that has not been done systematically for the zoo of platonic helices, which I've identified maybe one or two other uh, helices um, have been given formal expressions. And I personally believe doing this would be a good master's thesis for someone using the math which I have developed in combination with a uh, symbolic algebra program like Mathematica. It shouldn't be too hard to produce these for the other Platonic and Archimedean solids. In closing, I'd like to summarize what's been done in this paper. We've proved Lord's observation and shown that, shown that changing twists smoothly changes tightness smoothly and continuously and moves through a torus, changing the chirality of the helix. The helix angle can be designed based on twist easily. Orboticists can use this to design polymorphism if they have a repeated subunit that they can vary, either electrically, mechanically, or some other way. Given a measured or desired helix, we can design subunits which will achieve it. This would appeal more to chemists than roboticists in most cases. The properties of platonic helices, Archimedean helices, and indeed arbitrary helices are easily calculated with closed form expressions. Finally, I'd like to end with a request for your input and feedback on this paper. Uh, is it worth sending to a journal? What journal should it be sent to? If so, um, can someone perhaps commend me in the mathematics sections of archive so that I can be published, so that I can publish the long paper as a preprint? Um, I recognize the possibility that this work was done 150 years ago and simply has not been brought to light recently, but I've been unable to find it published anywhere. Thank you.